Firstly, good afternoon to one and all present here. Hope you are all safe and sound. On behalf of ISI Bangalore students, I welcome all to the seventh day of the Mathematics Online Camp of Limit. Now, some names do not need any introduction. Certainly not our guest speaker today. He was born in Anantapur, Andhra Pradesh, brought up in Chennai, where he completed BN Mathematics from Vivekananda College. He was awarded his PhD by the University of Bombay in 1966. Through a long career span, he has held various positions in many academic institutions in different countries, including US, European countries, and Japan. He is currently head of National Center of Mathematics, IIT Bombay. Please join your hands together to welcome the chairman of National Board for Higher Mathematics, author of discrete subgroups of Lee Groups, a fellow of the Royal Society, Padma Bhushan Awardee, Dr. Madhabusi Swantanam Raghunathan to enlighten us on arithmetic and geometry. Over to you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> well, this is uh, going to talk more about mathematics than mathematics itself. Uh, the title, as you see, is arithmetic and geometry, which are the two broad divisions in mathematics. Everything else falls under either arithmetic or geometry, or it's an offshoot of these subjects. For instance, what you call analysis is an offshoot of geometry. And what we call <clears throat> algebra is an offshoot of arithmetic. These two disciplines have, have uh, evolved, seem to have evolved more or less separately, though there is a lot in common between them. <clears throat> Let me begin by first recalling how mathematics started. All mathematics, of course, starts with counting. And counting was born of a necessity. Humans had to keep track of their possessions. And in the primitive marketplace, it was needed to set terms of barter, like one goat to be traded against five hens and so on. So that's how counting started. From, <coughs> from primitive days. Primitive counting is, no doubt, but it still displays one of the essential characteristics of all mathematics, abstraction. Abstraction has two components. It identifies commonalities among diverse, apparently disparate phenomena. <clears throat> On the other hand, abstraction often involves ignoring the irrelevant in an investigation. And both these aspects are to be seen in counting. It seems instinctive, yet it involves profound abstraction in both its aspects. The human mind recognizes that there can be something common to a bunch of disparate collections, the number of members in the collection. At the same time, it ignores when counting individual characteristics of the members of the collection. I illustrate this with the number five in the next slide. The slide has pictures of two different flowers of a right palm of the Pandava, of the Pandava brothers with Draupadi and a left foot. <clears throat> What is common among them all are the number five, the number of petals in the two very different flowers, the number of fingers in the palm, the number of Pandava brothers, and the number of toes in the foot. All these have, have num are in number five, and that's what is common to all of them. And these collections are as disparate as they come. One collection has nothing to do with the other petals. What do they have with Pandava brothers and so on? Here is the illustration number five. You can see that's a hibiscus, and this is a flower which I believe is called Sada Bahar or Sada Bahar, I don't know. Uh, that is the fingers in a right palm and toes in the left foot. And here are the Pandava brothers with Draupadi. So they're all very, very different kinds of collections, but still the human mind is able to identify something common among them, and that is nothing but what we call the number five. <clears throat> Counting, combined with the demands of the marketplace, gave rise to all the arithmetic we learned in school, like addition, subtraction, division, etc. Multiplication, everything comes from essentially originates in the marketplace. <clears throat> the old adage, necessity is the mother of invention, is borne out by this. <clears throat> but arithmetic soon enough acquired a life of its own, asking and answering questions about numbers not relevant at all to the practical world. We know the theorem of Pythagoras. 
it has no doubt some practical use, but that is not adequate reason for making lists of integral Pythagorean triplets. That is triplets A, B, C, F integers such that A square plus B square equal to C square. The Babylonians made such lists 4,000 years ago, <clears throat> more than something like 4,000 years ago. And uh, such lists are not called for for any practical use. I mean, if, if you want to use uh, the theorem for, in practice, particular numbers are involved, and you just try and see if you can, uh, if they satisfy the condition you want. But these guys wrote down Pythagorean triplets of integers, triples of integers, 4,000 years ago. And here is the clay tablet, which displays all those Pythagorean uh, numbers. And <clears throat> so this shows that mathematics as an intellectual pursuit goes back more than 3,500 years ago. Clay tablets seen on the right, excavated in, the Iraq, in Iraq and dated back to 1,500 BC, have lists of integral Pythagorean triplets, indicating ancient Babylon so engagement with mathematics. <clears throat> the Greeks, in the middle of the first millennium before the common era, <clears throat> that is some 2,500 years ago, <clears throat> brought a veritable revolution in the way we view and do mathematics. They introduced what we call axiomatization. They thought of geometry as an edifice of properties of geometric shapes built on a set of clearly stated self-evident truths, which they called axioms, through logical deduction. <clears throat> In the rest of the world, too, this was how mathematics was done, but without the awareness that the Greeks brought to it. The Greeks were the first people to become aware that <clears throat> you have to state clearly what you assume. Some things are taken for granted, and those have to be stated clearly, and everything has to be deduced logically from that in clear, in clear terms. And that is what the Greeks did for, the, for geometry way back 500 years before the common era. <clears throat> so elsewhere too, people do, did do mathematics, but they didn't clearly state what their assumptions are. And there was a certain amount of vagueness about the way they went about it. Though eventually, whatever was done could be put into the framework which uh, Euclid invented, which, uh, which the Greeks invented. But as they went along, they did not really realize that this is what was being done elsewhere, in India, in China, where also mathematics flourished. The Greeks brought about this revolution. And in fact, in some sense, it, it is a revolution of our idea of what knowledge is about, <clears throat> all knowledge. In fact, all science is based on deduction, making some hypothesis and arriving at directions. Of course, except that in natural sciences, these hypotheses and deductions <clears throat> have to agree with uh, what actually happens. Actually, in some sense, even in mathematics, that's how it worked. The axioms Euclid made explained what we intuitively perceive as straight lines, triangles, circles, etc. <clears throat> and he just... Uh, isolated some of the properties which are which he thought were self-evident and put them in and then once they put it in you don't have to know what they represent that they represent straight lines and or circles or whatever the various geometric shapes which he which are named there so don't you don't have to identify them with what we intuitively call straight line circles or something there are some undefined objects they serve to describe the reality of our intuition <clears throat> about geometry. Euclid's element is an exposition of geometry, developing everything based on five postulates, and his directions are based on five common notions, which are essentially logical principles. The common notions are nothing but logical principles. The postulates are what we these days call axioms. <clears throat> Many of Euclid's theorems are much relevant. I know I'm not. Don't have much, that's the wrong statement I made there. Do not have much relevance to the practical world. For example, he shows that the three angular bisectors of a triangle meet at a point. This is not of great significance practically. Because if you really have to work with bisectors, you will discover in practice that they meet at a point. 
But what Euclid did was to prove that it happens on the basis of simply the axioms he formulated. There is Euclid for you, and the there's a, a fragment of the Greek text, original Greek text on the pap papyrus. The Euclid is on the right, and uh, all the extant versions of elements are derived from Arabic translations of the original text made around 1800 of the Christian era, of the common era, during the reign of the, caliph, the famous caliph Harun al-Rashid. The original Greek text of elements is essentially lost. The, the full text is not available. Some fragments are available, and you see one such fragment in the picture there. And Euclid is on the right. So the, here are the axioms of Euclid. It does not really, it's not very really, really important for us to know what the axioms are, for you to know what the axioms are now. If you to re refer to uh, Euclid's elements, the axioms are stated there. But let me just go state them once and lead them out. There's a unique straight line joining any two distinct points. A straight line segment, we don't know what a straight line is, but this is a, and we do not know what points are, but there's a unique straight line joining any two points is true. And joining is also a notion which is uh, undefined. <clears throat> a straight line segment joining two points can be extended indefinitely on either side. The, there are entities and notions, both uh, all, all of which are undefined. They correspond to our per intuitive perception of a point, straight line, and lines joining them. And all the words there are words which interpret our per intuitive perceptions, are words we use in our intuitive perception. There is a unique circle with any center and any radius. All right angles are equal to one another. <clears throat> the parallel postulate. It says, if a straight line falling on two straight lines, make the interior angles on the same side, Less than the two, less than two right angles, the two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on the side on which the angles are less, the sum of the angles are less than two right angles. Now this is uh, formulated in different ways. We also can also formulate in it's uh, sometimes it's anyway from this one of the results that is deduced is that uh, if two straight lines are parallel to each other, that means they don't meet however extended. That's the definition of uh, parallels. If that happens, then if you take any intercept, it makes the corresponding angles and the alternate angles are equal. It's a kind of statement that one states as a theorem. Anyway, all this can be deduced. The theorem can be deduced from these axioms and <clears throat> using directive principles, which are stated here. The common directive principles are here. Things that are equal to the same thing are also equal to one another. That's called the transitive property of Euclidean relation. If equals are added to equals, then the holes, holes are equal, addition property of equality. If equals are subtracted from equals, then the differences are equal, subtraction property of equality. Things that coincide with one another are equal to one another, reflexive property. The whole is greater than the part. <clears throat> All this are the logical principles that we apply when we make deductions. Now, Euclid had introduced his axioms when in the study of geometry. On the other hand, Euclid's elements also contains a number of results about in number theory, about numbers. For some curious reason, Euclid did not introduce the axioms for numbers. Maybe he found it difficult to do that. It was an axiomatic approach to arithmetic of numbers, in, so to speak, was achieved only in the 19th century by Richard Dedekind and Giuseppe Piano. Euclid's elements, as also some number theory, curiously Euclid did not attempt to axiomatize number theory. In fact, fitting whole numbers in an axiomatic setup was achieved only in the 19th century. Richard Dedekind proposed a set of axioms and Piano followed the Followed it up with a more elegant formulation known as known as now known as Piano's axioms. <clears throat> I'll come back to Piano's axioms at a later point. But let me now tell you of a beautiful piece of number theory which we owe to the Greeks, more specifically to Euclid. Many of you probably know this already, but let me uh, once again go through this because it's one of the pieces of mathematics which 
every mathematician, he, practically any mathematician, considers beautiful. <clears throat> the theorem as well as its proof. We call that a prime number, or simply a prime, is a whole number greater than one, whose only divisors are itself and one. No other whole number divides it other than one and itself. That's what a prime is. The first few primes are two, uh, sorry, I've forgotten two there, two, three, five, seven, eleven, et cetera, et cetera. One cannot uh, write down a formula hmm, which will give yield primes all the time. It's uh, uh, yields, the nth prime, you cannot write down formula. That's not possible. Euclid posed himself first the following question. First of all, does this sequence of prime go on forever? The question he posed himself is that. Is the collection of all primes a finite collection? <clears throat> and he answered it in the negative. He proved the following theorem. The set of all prime numbers is an infinite set. And here is a question which is of no practical importance, whatever. <clears throat> it, if you, I mean, maybe the set of primes is fine, infinite, but what if, I mean, you, you, can, you can keep on writing down primes perhaps, so what? That doesn't... Uh, in any way, it doesn't seem to be of, in any way of practical use. But nevertheless, Euclid got curious about it, asked the question, and answered it, and answered it beautifully. Here is uh, the way he proved it. If the collection of P of all primes is finite, they can be listed as P1, P2, etc., PR. R, say there are R of them, they can list it like that. So they can be listed like that. Let N be the product of all the PIs, P1, into P2 into PR plus one. Then N is greater than all the primes listed. Therefore, N is not a prime. <clears throat> I will. So it's only because I added one here, it is obviously greater than every PI, so it's not a prime. It follows that N has devices different from one net itself. <clears throat> so N is not a prime, therefore it has devices, which is different from one and itself. So, among them, among them, there's the smallest one. Let D be the smallest of these proper devices of n. A device is different from one and n, but smallest among all the devices of n. As any device of D divides n as well, we see that D must be a prime, and hence equals PI for some I with one less than root I less than root R. So D is, must be a prime because if D divides, <coughs> if something divides D, it divides N as well because D divides N, and therefore, and D is the smallest divisor of N. So it follows that the anything which divides D must be either equal to one or D. So <coughs> D must be a prime, and hence equals PI for some I with one less than root I less than root R. But now look at the definition of n. If you divide n by any of the primes, you are left with a reminder of 1. So, <clears throat> none of the pi divide n. No prime divides n, which is absurd because we know that d divides n. So that gives you a contradiction, which shows that the number of primes is necessarily finite. The set p is necessarily infinite. The set p must be an infinite set. If it is finite, we arrive to the contradiction. 2,000 years after Euclid, Euler device another really elegant but less elementary proof of the theorem. He this involved the, he deduced the theorem from two other theorems which I state now. The first of these is something which you have which you all know that the infinite geometric sum sigma x power n equals one by one minus x if mod x is less than one. Some of you may not have seen a rigorous proof of this or the next theorem for that matter. Next theorem. For one thing, the infinite sum needs to be given a precise meaning. I don't know if you're if you already come across the precise meaning, come across these things, but anyway, I, I'm not going to it, but you know, you certainly already in school you knew this, and uh, it, it does make sense intuitively. The next theorem again is something you may be familiar with, but not seen a rigorous proof. <clears throat> Every positive integer greater than one is uniquely a product of powers of primes, pi power alpha i equal to zero to r, 
arranged in increasing order and r5 are positive integers so it can be written as p1 per r found into p2 per r found to such a pr for alpha r where the primes p1 p2 pr are uniquely determined once you put them in increasing order and then their powers alpha i, the, the index alpha i, the that is the power to which you are raising pi is also uniquely determined by the number n <clears throat> any positive integer is such a product this is called unique factorization and you have certainly come across that now euler's proof goes to this way suppose that the set of primes is finite then one has look at the product pi 1 minus 1 by p this is the same as product of product of 1 minus 1 by p as p varies over all primes a finite product but each of these 1 minus 1 by p can be expanded as infinite series because then we know that 1 by p is less than 1 so sigma is equal to sigma 0 to infinity 1 over p per r then multiply it out you find that what you get is sum of all the reciprocals of all the integers every integer n will come from uniquely from a product of primes prime powers it will have some pi p per p per r p you like as p where is over p <clears throat> so it, this number sigma the, the product here is sigma 1 by n n equal to 1 to infinity now this is a finite product and each of those numbers is a finite number so this whole thing is finite but as some of you know this infinite sum is infinite is not finite so that gives you a contradiction now the infinite sum above cannot be finite and i give you a proof for that one way of saying this as follows look the infinite sum is certainly greater than any truncated finite sum so i look at the sum from n equal to 2 power r to 2 power r plus 1, 1 by n and you know these are reciprocals of odd numbers between 2 power r and 2 power r plus 1 so they are all greater than or equal to 1 over 2 power r plus 1 Okay, and there are two power r plus one minus two numbers here, so it's greater than two. One by two. Sorry, uh, that's sorry. It is there are uh, each each term here is greater than one by two. Uh, this should be a sigma there. Each term is greater than one by two, and there are two power r plus one minus two power r terms, which is two power r minus two. So sum two. Then you could want to 2 cube 1 by n is greater to 2 power q minus 1. So this sum is greater than 2 power q 1 over 2 power q, 2 power q minus 1. The sum is greater than 2 power q minus 1 for every q. That's a contradiction. So it becomes infinite sum. Thus p has to be finite. Euler's proof was forerunner of the use of analysis, which is an offshoot of geometry in number theory. The theme of this lecture is essentially that geometry and number theory. Contrary to what was happening in the first 2,000 years after they came into existence, <clears throat> are closely connected, and Euler's proof is an example where geometry provided the proof, a proof of a theorem in number theory, <clears throat> the infinite of primes. Analysis is an offshoot of geometry. Euler also proved a very nice uh, theorem in Euclidean geometry. Which these days I don't think you people come across in your school or college curriculum. It's called the he discovered what is called the nine point circle. See, suppose A B C is a triangle. <clears throat> Then look at the midpoints D E F D E F of the three sides. They obviously lie in a circle. Any three points we know lie in a circle. Now this circle also contains six other points associated with the triangle. Which are the points? These are the points G, F, G, H, which are the feet of the perpendiculars from A, B, C. <clears throat> they are the feet of the perpendicular A to the, sorry, the feet of the perpendicular are called G, H, I. D, E, F are the midpoints. G is the uh, foot of the perpendicular from A to B, C. H is the foot of the perpendicular from B to A, C, and <clears throat> I is the perpendicular from C to A, B. These three points also lie in the circle. So you have you have a point which goes through three circles. That's uniquely determined. The circle also passes through these three other points, the feet, the altitudes in the triangle. And then 
we know that the altitudes, three altitudes meet at a point called the ortho center. Now, it turns out that you take the line joining A and the ortho center and take its middle point. If you call it J, J also lies on the circle. Similarly, you take B and, <clears throat> and join it to the ortho center, take the midpoint K, that also lies on this. And says, lies on the nine on the on the circle, uh, and then finally C and take the <clears throat> midpoint of C, the joining line uh, join, of the segment joining C and the ortho center, call it L. L also lies on the circle we described. So the circle has nine nine points associated with triangle on it, namely D E F, <clears throat> G H I, and J K L. So Euler discovered this. Very interesting fact, which again has is has no practical use really. Right? I don't know if anybody has come across a use for the nine-point circle in any practical matter. So anyway, Euler made this discovery, which again shows that mathematics develops with a <clears throat> with a dynamic which is its own, which uh, you ask questions which are related to mathematical structures themselves and answer them, and that's how mathematics develops most of the time. Of course, it also sometimes gets inspiration from outside, as happened when Newton discovered calculus. He essentially invented calculus to explain motion. <clears throat> anyway, let me go on to point out. Number three is a study of the discrete, while geometry is engaged in understanding the continuous. Both these notions, you understand intuitively what they mean. <clears throat> Though deductive reasoning is common to both, they developed along parallel lines, and for some 2,000 years, ideas from one area seldom played any role in the other. <clears throat> but that ended with the advent of René Descartes and his analytic geometry. The identification of point in the plane with a pair of numbers and geometric figures with sets of pairs started in an equation enabled an interface of geometry and number theory. Geometric figures were described by algebraic equations between two numbers x, y. And then if the algebraic equation is an equation with all the coefficients in Q and the, and if you look for solutions which lie in Q, that's essentially number theory. Or solutions which lie in integers, that would essentially be looking for asking a question in number theory. <clears throat> so this is how geometry gets related to number theory. I will presently give an example of this. Here is a picture of Descartes. There is a famous quotation of Descartes, which you would have, many of you would have heard, cogito ergo sum in Latin, which means I think, therefore I am. I exist because I think. That's what uh, Descartes said. And his analytic geometry brought fresh insights into the study of conics, which had been initiated by the great, great Greek geometer Apollonius. I don't know if you have ever seen a theorem of Apollonius, who proved many interesting results about conics. A conic is the figure you get if you intersect a plane, if you intersect a cone, a circular, right circular cone, by a, pla a plane at an angle to its base. What you get is a conic. When you take something parallel to the base, you get a circle. So a circle is a special case of a conic. And Apollo just studied conics. Once again, Apollo studied conics because he found, it, found the thing interesting and for no other reason. Though Newton discovered, or rather Kepler discovered, that planets move in the, the orbits of planets are conics. That was 1500, 1600 years later, or even more. But Apollonius already was interested in conics and studied that, which again shows you that mathematics develops with a dynamics of its own. <clears throat> okay, let me now give you the example I wanted to talk about. Now, look at, I told you already that uh, the <clears throat> Mesopotamians were interested in integral Pythagorean triplets. That is, ABC is integral Pythagorean triplet, triple. If a, B, C are integers and A square plus B square equal to C square. And suppose A, B, C is the integral Pythagorean triple, then n, n times A, n times B, n times C is also 
uh, put the code in triple or any integer n. Once you have one a, b, c, you can find a lot more by simply multiplying them by an integer, positive or negative. So to determine all integral Pythagorean triples, it suffices to determine all primitive ones. And what do I mean by primitive ones? The primitive ones are those where a, b, c, a, b, and c do not have a common factor, and they're all assumed to be positive or non-negative. A, b, c are non-negative and have no common factor. Then we have the following theorem, which tells you how to get all integral Pythagorean triples, which are primitive. Once you get primitive ones, you can get every one of them by simply multiplying them by a suitable by some integer. So the theorem says the following: Let PQ be integers which are co-prime integers that, that P and Q don't have any common factor. Then set rho to be equal to one or half according as P minus Q is odd or even. That <coughs> P and Q are prime integers co-prime together. So they cannot be both even. So what can happen is that one of them is odd and the other is even, or both can be odd. If both are odd, p minus q is even. So you have to, that's why I have to separate two cases. So I take rho to be one if p minus q is odd, and if rho to be half if p minus q is even. Then <clears throat> look at two rho p q, twice rho times p times q, and then rho times p square minus q square, and rho times p square plus q square. This is a primitive integral Pythagorean triple. Every primitive integral Pythagorean triple is necessarily of this form, for some pq, pq co-prime to each other. So this is completely classifies all integral primitive Pythagorean triples, and therefore all integral Pythagorean triples. <coughs> that the this number, this triple, is a Pythagorean triple, is the result of elementary algebra, which you all know. It says, if you have, <coughs> if A, B are integers, A square minus B square, A square plus B square, and twice A, B, they form a Pythagorean triple. Rather, I should start with twice A, B, A square minus B square, and a square plus b square. Because if you take a square plus b square, you get a power 4 plus b power 4 minus uh, plus 2 twice a square b square. But if you take a square minus b square whole square, you get a square plus b square minus 2 a square b square. So if you subtract one from the other, the bigger one from the, if you subtract the smaller one from the other, you get 4 a square b square, which is a square of 2 a b. So high school algebra already tells you that that's a Pythagorean triple. Notice that uh, when you take rho times uh, p, <coughs> the, in the previous slide, notice that these numbers, because of our definition, are integers. Twice rho pq, rho times p square minus p square, rho, rho p square plus q square. Even though it is, involves division by half, it is uh, these three are integers. Anyway, if the if you have integers like this, then we know it's a Pythagorean triple. And it's easy to check they are primitive. I will leave that as an exercise to you. Suppose now that ABC is a primitive integral Pythagorean triple. Then C plus minus A are integers. And any common factor of the two is also a common factor of 2C and 2A. It follows that the two have at most two as a common factor, that is C plus A and C minus A have at most two as a common factor. <coughs> as A, B, C is primitive, A and B have no common factors. It is then easy to see from this that the second assertion of the theorem holds, which tells you what are all the primitive integral Pythagorean triplex. I leave it to you to check the details. Now, I will show you another way of uh, doing this using geometry. And uh, the interest in this is that it helps you solve a host of other problems of a similar kind, <clears throat> which, you, which you will find difficult to solve by the method I just now described. But one method will give you lots of 
so lots of ways and so sorry we'll give you a method of solving lots of other problems of a similar kind how does one do this observe first that a b c is an integral pythagorean triple i would say not equal to zero a by c b by c is a point on the unit circle this pair is a look of it look at it as a point in the plane which is a element of it's a point on the circle in this set of points x y such that x square plus y square equal to 1 circle of unit radius with origin to the center <clears throat> so any pythagorean integral pythagorean triple gives in a natural way a point of the circle conversely suppose psi eta is a point on the circle with rational coordinates so psi eta is a point on the circle with whose coordinates are rational then for suitable integer namely the gcd of the denominators of psi and eta <clears throat> n times psi and n times eta and n this triple is an integral pythagorean triple as you can easily see <clears throat> so this should be sorry n times psi i should have said sorry it should be uh, n square psi square n square eta square and n, n square that will be an integral pythagorean triple yeah all these three terms should have been squares should have been squared so that tells you how to arrive at integral pythagorean triples starting with rational numbers <coughs> so determining integral pythagorean triples the problem is the same as locating points on the circle with rational coordinates now how do i locate points on the circle with rational coordinates first there is this point n whose coordinates are 1 0 which is obviously on the circle that will, that requires no proof it's obvious okay now start with this point n and then pick any point on circle say p and which is rational coordinates join n and p by a straight line that will intersect the x axis in exactly one point as the picture shows you can all make it uh, completely regress by you know taking the point uh, right end of the equation of the line joining n and p so write down the coordinates of p and then uh, write down the equation joining the line you have that line and you have the x axis there are two lines you can easily show intersect at the point at some point p prime and that point has rational coordinates the reason is the <coughs> These are two straight lines, which are, if you look at their equations, they are both have the equations are over Q. That is, all the coefficients in the equation involved are in Q. From that, it is easy to see that the intersection point has also coordinates in Q. So, if you join n with a point on the circle with <coughs> rational coordinates, then it intersects the x-axis in a point which has also rational coordinates. So, to recover p. you can go to n join n with p prime and make it intersect the circle now take now we have seen that p prime has rational coordinates now start with the p prime with rational coordinates on x join n and p prime and extend it till it meets the circle of course sometimes it may not meet the circle it may be the circle only in one point like if you go outside the circle way out here and join it by a line it won't obviously meet the circle so if it does meet the circle it will meet at a point with rational coordinates why that's i explain that a little below so <clears throat> what i've done here is to first explain so i took the line joining np write down the equation of the circle and from that deduce that the intersection point yeah put take the point n join it to a point p <clears throat> on the Uh, for point p prime on the x axis whose coordinates are t0 then x by t equals x minus 0 by t minus 0 equals y minus 1 by 0 minus 1 is the equation for the straight line joining n and p <clears throat> so the equation is really ultimately comes out to be x by t equal to 1 minus y and then if we want to look at the intersection of these two l and s1 That, that is corresponds to a point y which satisfies this equation then a number y which satisfies this equation t is equal to 1 minus y plus y y square equal to 1 because the x coordinate equals 1 minus y if the point is on the circle 
Then if, if the point is in the straight line. So if it's also on the circle, you get this equation, which is a quadratic equation for y, and you want to solve for it. You already know one solution, namely this point n, which is the intersection, which is one zero. That is, there the x coordinate is zero. From that, it is easy to see that the y coordinate has to be rational. Write down the equation. The y coordinate is necessarily a rational number. So, if x y not equal to zero is in Q two intersection S one, then the line joining x y and n meets the x axis at a point with coordinates Q, as I said earlier. Anyway, this is tells you how to get at all the solutions of the equation x square plus y square equal to one with rational x rational numbers x and y. The determination of all points on the unit circle with rational coordinates one is a special case of the following general. Problem. Let a i one less one i less one to n be contain be a subset of Q. That I take n points in Q, n rational numbers. Determine the set P Q of all points with rational coordinates. The set P, which is a set of points in R n, R n n dimensional Euclidean space, the n coordinates, and sigma a i x i square equal to one. And the proof goes entirely analogously, and it can solve. With the same geometric method as follows: the set could be empty, but once it is not, and you locate one point, which was necessary in that case. Suppose you're able to locate one point, then you can get it all points. <coughs> Let P Q be the <coughs> set of all points which lie on this set, the set of x i one less one to r n, with the property that sigma i x i square equal to one. The special case of the circle corresponds to the case when i the n is two and both the a's are one, and this is the equation: x by x one square plus x two square equal to one. What's the idea? Once you have the point Q, what you do is to look at. We know that uh, Q is a point on this surface. On this, uh, that satisfies this equation: x by x i square equal to one. So not all the coordinates of Q can be zero. There will be one coordinate at least which is not zero. So pick such a coordinate which I call uh, I call the point. Uh, I locate the point Yan, and I assume, yeah, yeah. The idea is this: you start with uh, the point Yan with coordinates in y, and if you take on some other point which is not. Which is different from n. At least one coordinate will be different from the co co corresponding coordinate of uh, n. That is, P R will not be equal to nu R. If you join P and Q by a straight line, it will go meet the set of points where the rth coordinate is zero in some point, which I let's call it P prime. And then P prime, you can see easily see <coughs> has rational coordinates. It's something which we did in the case of uh, the circle. You can similarly imitate this and see the rational coordinate. So to arrive at the points, the idea is to take a point in the plane. So to choose a. So the conversely, suppose P not is a point on on HR. HR is this hyperplane set of points where the rth coordinate is zero. Set of points in Euclidean n space where the rth coordinate is zero, and this a point HR. <coughs> Take a point P not in HR. The line joining it. P not the line joining it. Line join line L not joining N and P not is given by the set of equations like this: XR minus nu R divided by minus nu R equals nu R equals divided by nu R equals X XR minus nu I minus P zero I minus nu I where P zero is this point. Whose coordinates are p zero i, and then the rth coordinate of all these points satisfies this quadratic equation. Rth coordinates of all the points, so satisfies the quadratic. I have substituted for all the other coordinates because they lie on the same line. So for each x i, I can write it in terms of nu r and x r, x r and nu r. 
So XR will satisfy this quadratic equation. And then this is a quadratic equation for XR, of which noir has to be root. And I want to claim that noir is rational. There are this is proved along with similar lines, except the algebra is a little more uh, complicated. Now, it's not really complicated, but little little more complicated than the original equation. And you find I won't go into details, then you find that the solution is rational. You have to isolate the case when the quadratic equation becomes linear, that is the coefficient of xr square becomes zero, in which case you get only one point of intersection. That's what happens when you take the point to lie outside the surface which you're looking at, and then there may be no point of intersection with the, with the surface other than the point n itself. If there is a second point of intersection, then it's given by a quadratic equation whose solutions are also rational because the equation, quadratic equation gets all coefficients which are rational. You have one solution which is rational, and you know that the coefficient of the term xr is, is essentially the, the sum of the two roots of the equation divided by the coefficient of xr square. xr square. And therefore, this coefficient of xr square is rational, as also the coefficient of xr. So you find that uh, the other root is also rational. So you find, you see, you're able to get at all these roots. If you know one solution, it's enough. And usually, in a problem, one will be able to locate one solution without any great difficulty. And then you get all the other solutions. So the geometric methods makes, makes it possible to find all solutions of this uh, <coughs> problem which is purely number theoretic question. First, you get rational solutions, and then you can get integral solutions by clearing the denominators. Now, let me go on from this yes, to sir. Fermat's last theorem. Yeah? Uh, sir, how do we know the equation of a line in, in Rn? Yeah, the, the equation of the line in Rn, it's, uh, it's written here. Okay, this is very similar to the equation in two variables where you had only two variables. What you did was the, you took the general point whose coordinate x r, say x1 minus nu1, that's a special point, and then you take the other point p1 minus nu1 or p01 minus nu1, but our p0 is p01 is 0. So that's how this has become that r equal to 1 is the case. And then you have only two variables, you just have one, one, one. One thing on the right hand side here, there are n equations. And when you, but every one of these, these equations will tell you that every one of these xi minus nu i is expressible in terms of xr minus nu r. Therefore, xi itself is expressible in terms of xr minus nu r and other known quantities, nu r, p0i, nu i, and so on. That's how when you substitute here, you get an equation purely in xr. All the other quantities are known. And then the coefficients ai are rational. We know that also. If p0i and nu i are also rational, and so nu r is also rational, then this becomes a quadratic equation with rational coefficients. And if you have a quadratic equation with rational coefficients, if one root is rational, the other root also has to be rational, because the sum of the two roots is essentially the coefficient of the xr term <coughs> divided by the coefficient, the minus of the coefficient of the xr term divided by the coefficient of xr squared term. The sum of the roots is precisely that. So because of that, we could solve the problem. Yeah. Okay. So that's how we located points in PQ, all the points in PQ with rational coordinates. So now let me move on to a related question. That is, what about the equation x2 plus y cube equals z cube? Or more generally, x power n plus y power n equals z power n. I expect that all of you have heard of Fermat's last theorem, which states the following. Let n be an integer greater than equal to 3. Then, if a, b, c are non-negative integers, such that a power n plus b power n equals c power n, then a equals 0 or b equals 0, and c equal to b or c equal to a accordingly. Very often, this theorem is stated by assuming all a, b, c are positive. So I've included the possibility of a, one of them being 0, and then this is the way, this is the way theorem is formulated. If you, all, if you allow all ABC to be positive, if you insist that all ABC be positive, then there are no solutions, is the way the theorem is stated. No integral solutions. Now, 
the case n equal to 2 was something which you just now went through extensively. And what Verma Slatharam says that it is not possible, you cannot find solutions in higher when n is greater than equal to 3. The theorem was proved by Andrew Wiles, a British working in Princeton University in 1994. Wiles proved the theorem is one of the high points of application of geometry to number theory. The geometry involved is deep and much of it developed in the 20th century. I will not be able to go into the proof, it's much too difficult. In fact, my own knowledge of the proof is rather sketchy, so I won't be able to communicate anything to you. I will now outline, however, the 350-year-old, 350-year history of the problem that culminated in the work of Weiss. How did the problem start? Now, Pierre, Pierre de Ferma was a contemporary of Descartes, <coughs> who lived in, they both lived in the 17th century. And like him, he was an all-time great mathematician. He was, a, he was by profession a judge in a provincial, provincial court in, in the French town of Toulouse. Mathematics was a passion, was a passionate hobby to which he devoted practically all his spare time. Among the books he studied avidly was a book on number theory by the mathematician Diophantus, an Alexandrian mathematician, Greek Alexandrian. It was Herma's habit to write his comments on the margins of the books he was studying. One such note on the margin of the chapter on Pythagorean triplets in the book is seen in the next slide. Here is the next slide. There you see Ferma. He was born in 16.1 and died in 1665, so 17th century. The marginal note he wrote on, on the page, on a page which uh, was devoted to study of Pythagorean triples by uh, Diophantus, he wrote this. On the contrary, it is impossible to separate a cube into the sum of two cubes, a fourth power into two fourth powers, or generally any power above the second power into powers of the same degree. <clears throat> That's the statement of the theorem. I have discovered a truly marvelous demonstration of this general theorem, which this margin is too narrow to hold, to contain. So that's what Fenbar wrote. Okay, in that uh, margin, there you have uh, the cover page of the edition which uh, Ferma possessed. It's not, a, I don't know if it's Ferma's own copy, but anyway, it's a, uh, the, that is the cover page of the tradition, and uh, it was a translation by a mathematician by name Bache, a French mathematician by name Bache. And <clears throat> on the left is a picture of Diophantus of Alexandria. The precise uh, dates are not known, somewhere between 2000 and 2014, and he died between 2070 and 284 of the common era. The Latin translation was by Claude Gaspar, Gaspar Bache of the book Arithmetica in, uh, into Latin. The original was in Greek. Once again, it was not available. It was available only in uh, fragments, but some portions uh, were fairly complete, and that is what this uh, translation holds. Uh, now, an unrated version of Diophantus Arithmetica with Ferba's comments was published by Ferba's son after his father's demise. Farmer was somewhat secretive and didn't share many of his uh, theorems and ideas with other mathematicians. So it's only after his demise, other mathematicians came to know of them. That brought the attention of the mathematical community at large to the marginal notes made by Farmer, in particular to the one I showed you just now. There are many other unproved statements appearing as notes on the margin in that book, but mathematicians could find proofs of all of them within a decade or two of Fermat's death. But the Fermat's class theorem, I elaborate the FNT, defied all efforts to prove it and therefore acquired its name. It's called Fermat's class theorem, even though people didn't know a proof of it. The next 300 years, <clears throat> efforts by many mathematicians resulted only in incremental progress, not much. Here are some of the mathematicians who attempted Fermat's class theorem and made incremental progress. There was Leonard Eider, whom we have already met. He <coughs> proved the theorem for case n equals 3. Incidentally, Fermat had a proof elsewhere 
in the case of n equal to 4. For n equals 3, they are not all that device to prove. And then there is legend Dirichlet who proved it for n equal to 5 and Gabriel Lame for n equal to 7. All these are uh, uh, Euler belong to the 18th century, these two to the 19th century. And then there was Sophie Germain, one of the very few uh, mathematicians to figure among the world's greats, <coughs> one of the very few women mathematicians to figure among the women's greats, and Ernest Kuma, who was uh, again a great mathematician of the 19th century. German could prove the theorem under the additional conditions ABC, which were uh, utilized by uh, <coughs> Directly in his proof for the case five, and maybe also by Lame for the case seven, n equals seven. Kumar showed the affinity is true under certain conditions on n, not on ABC on n, and deduced the theorem for n less than to 100, for all numbers less than to 100. In fact, he deduced it for all number primes first for all primes less than to 100, and therefore it actually follows for all numbers which are whose uh, only prime devices are less than 100. So the, he could prove it for infinitely many years. Kumar's ideas developed in this context constitute the foundation of modern number theory. Some 10 years before Wiles proved Fermat's theorem, last theorem, Gerd Faltings, Gerd Faltings, a German mathematician, put a result using geometry, which is a conjecture of Louis Model an American mathematician who worked in Cambridge, which constituted great progress on Fermat's last theorem. This is not very well known outside the com mathematic mathematical community, <clears throat> by which I mean working mathematicians. Uh, outside, even many students don't, have not heard the name, uh, get Fartings or model for that matter, which uh, Fartings proves this important conjecture, which was which has great progress, as you will see, on Fermat's last theorem. The very formulation of the conjecture, however, involves some geometric terms. I will tell you what the conjecture is, though I may not be able to explain everything involved, but I will tell you what the model conjecture is. Let f be a homogeneous polynomial of degree n in three variables with coefficients in q. This means that f x, y, z is of the form sigma a, p, q are some coefficients in q x power p, y power q, z power r, where p plus q plus r adds up to the same n for all the terms. So it involves only monomials in the form x power p, y power q plus z power r, with p plus q plus z r equal to fixed number n, and then the coefficient a, p, q, r is in q. I consider such a polynomial f. <coughs> then f defines a geometric object. In C3, the three-dimensional complex vector space. I look at three-dimensional complex space, like R3, you can also talk of C3, though it is uh, cannot be visualized. It's a six-dimensional Euclidean space. It's the same as R6, if you like. But what's the geometric object I'm looking at? It's it's a set of points with complex coefficients, uh, complex coordinates, such that f x y z is zero. This set is obviously a geometric object. Like, like after all, the circle is a geometric object. This is a Similar thing in higher dimensions, except that we are now asking for coordination with complex. But anyway, it's a geometric object. So the geometric object ZF, one can associate the number G called its G dash. Now, this is a somewhat difficult thing to for me to define for you because it requires some background. Uh, you know, geometric you can associate numbers to geometric objects. For instance, you can associate the number, take a ellipse. Take a quadratic equation in two variables. It could the resulting theme could be an ellipse, a parabola, or a hyperbola. Now, to the parabola and to the ellipse, you can associate the number one because there seem to be one connected curve, connected in intuitive sense. So you cannot the ellipse is a connected curve like that, and parabola is an infinite curve but connected like that. Whereas hyperbola has two branches, each of which is connected. So it is two. So we also have the number two to the hyperbola and one to ellipse and parabola. So there are similar things which you can associate to 
this is a geometric object, object ZF, which is called the genus. I can't really define it because it's, it involves a little more elaborate background. <clears throat> anyway, there is such a number called an integer, in fact, called genus GF. <clears throat> Recall that element ABC in Z3 to be primitive if ABC have no common factor. That's like what, what we did in uh, uh, case of Pythagorean triples. We then have the following. Yeah, we then have the following conjecture made by Louis Model. If the genus GF of ZF is greater than or equal to 2, then the set ABC, which is the intersection of all integral triples ABC, which, which lie, which, which is the set of all integral triples ABC, which lie on the, on the geometric object ZF. I'll refer to it as a surface on the geometric surface zf when z is equal to x power n plus y power n minus z power n we are looking for f equals zero so that is the perma equation if you like x power n y equal to the x power n, x power n plus y power n equal to z power n that's same as x power n plus y power n minus z power n with n greater than equal to four it turns out that the genus is greater than equal to two so the upshot is that's the model conjecture implies that the equation x power n plus y power n minus z power n for n greater than uh, four has only finitely many primitive solutions. One, and uh, to say that x power one plus y power one equal to z power one has only primitive solutions is the same thing as saying saying that x power one plus y power one equal z power n holds only if one of x or y is zero. For x y z non-negative uh, integral ones. So that will give you the Fermat's last theorem. If you could prove that the finite number is one, but the uh, Falkin's theorem does not quite give you that. It only says it's finite. On the other hand, it encompasses a large number of equations, not just the Fermi equation. And in fact, uh, Falkin's theorem, or even models conjecture, is even more general. But I can, for that, I need to introduce many more concepts such, which I don't want to. So I won't go into it. Here is a picture of a uh, model, who is a Cambridge mathematician, but originally American. And get Faltings, who was a German. Geometry starts with the concept of the number line, also called real numbers. It is in the mid 19th century that Dedekind, as I told you, defined, sorry, Dedekind, Dedekind and the piano axioms are introduced. And in the Dedekind defined real numbers using the existence of integers given by the piano axioms. Maybe it's part of your syllabus, I'm not sure, but I, I don't want to go into it. But Dedekind was able to define real numbers starting with piano axioms. So the piano axioms can be formulated in the following concise way. There is a set n, that is essentially integers, there's a set called integers if you like, n, and an injective self map, yes, n to n, which is, that is a successor map, which is not bijective, satisfying the following condition. If e is a subset of n, and e is not equal to n, and sc is contained in e, then e is an sn. This is not the usual way in which uh, piano axioms are formulated. If you have come across the axiom, you would have seen it in a somewhat different setup. But this is entirely equivalent to whatever other formulations are given. So all geometry is based on piano axioms and so on arithmetic. You need piano axioms to develop arithmetic, and arithmetic goes into the definition of real numbers. So all geometry is based on the on piano axioms, and therefore. <clears throat> All geometry is really derived from arithmetic. All mathematics is therefore derived from the piano axioms. The fact, this fact that Leopold Kronecker, one of the greats of the uh, 19th century, to the famous quote, the whole numbers have been made by God, everything else is the work of man. Well, in formulating the piano axioms, the notion of set has evidently been taken for granted. It's a, it has a key role. <coughs> We think of sets as a collection of objects, as an intuitive idea of a set, concrete or abstract, and we perform diverse operations on them. And so it will be, appear that all mathematics is built on the foundations of set theory.
However, it was discovered that a loose use of sets could lead to contradictions. One such contradiction is the famous Russell paradox, which some of you would have heard of. I will describe this paradox presently, but the paradox led to the let the axiomatizing set theory to avoid pitfalls that intuition can lead us into. So, Russell's paradox results from our handling sets with the way our intuition guides us, and that led to a paradox. So, clearly, it was necessary to axiomatize set theory so that we don't unconsciously use things which are ill defined. So, let me describe the Russell paradox. Let us call a set ordinary respectively extraordinary, if S does not belong to S. If S does not belong to S, we call S ordinary. If S belongs to S, then we call it call S extraordinary. You know, it's going to be difficult to define sets which are extraordinary, that is, sets which belong to themselves. One can attempt something like that, but it's unsatisfactory. For instance, a set which can be described by using less than 50 English words, then such a set will qualify as belonging to itself. But the definition is obviously somewhat unsatisfactory, though it is not completely precluded by our intuition. So let's now look at the set of all ordinary sets. The set, then the set O is either ordinary or extraordinary. There are only two possibilities. An ordinary set cannot be extraordinary and vice versa. Then O is either ordinary or extraordinary. Suppose it's ordinary, then it belongs to O. That means O belongs to O. O is an ordinary set, then O belongs to O. But that makes O extraordinary. That means O is extraordinary. That's a contradiction. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if it is extraordinary, then O belongs to O. But then, O consists entirely of ordinary sets. So, O cannot belong to O, again a contradiction. Our intuition does not rule out the existence of all extraordinary sets. That's why you have to have some axiomatic setup which eliminates such contradictions. So, there's a need for an axiom system for set theory which avoids our getting into such a paradoxical situation. And if you have a good axiom system for set theory, then all mathematics can be derived from that using logical deduction. The paradox is named after Bertrand Russell, who pointed it out. Russell is better known as a public intellectual who was involved in uh, the peace, peace movement. Now, the Zermelo devised such an axiom system for set theory, and Frankel made some improvements on it. So, that's the best known axiom system for set theory, and it's known as the zermelo frankel system, which legitimizes arguments one normally uses when dealing with sets. Most arguments we use not normally become legitimate in this system. No inconsistencies, no inconsistencies have surfaced so far. In particular, the Russell paradox. This system. The set cannot belong to itself, and so the Russell paradox does not arise. So nobody has discovered any other paradox to discredit this axiom system. Well, that's all I really want to say. So all mathematics is really there from this. So arithmetic, first comes set theory, from which you derive arithmetic, from which you derive uh, geometry, and the various other branches, which are sub-branches of these two areas, are really arise from these two branches and therefore arise from set theory. Well, so this is the end of my lecture. Thank you for your attention. I don't think I have anything more interesting to tell you. Thank you. I'm now open to questions, please. Uh, thank you, sir. There was a really wonderful lecture by you. Really fascinating. Now, as sir said, he's open for questions. So if any of the participants have any questions, you can kindly ask sir now.
Well, there don't seem to be any questions. Let me make uh, one last uh, remark. You know, there is a very beautiful book called "What Is Men of Mathematics." I, some of you would have heard about it by a mathematician by name E.T. Bell. It contains short biographies of uh, all great mathematicians right up to the end of the 19th century. The there are there is one person who probably We lived into the 20th century, Poincaré. But I think the rest of the mathematicians uh, who who figure in that uh, book all belong to pre, pre belong to the 19th century or before. It starts with Archimedes, who is rated as one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, and then goes on chronologically over many of the great mathematicians. And some of the names I mentioned, you will see. Their biographies, in fact, practically all of them, except for possibly Dirichlet, you will, and Piano, you will find their biographies described there. It's a very nice book and very inspiring, and I strongly recommend uh, the book for all of you to read. It's uh, th there is sometimes some mathematics in it which describes the work of the authors, which you may not be able to follow, but that does not matter. You can skip that, and still it makes very good reading. It's an excellent uh, book, which I strong, strongly recommend. Another book which I recommend for you is called "What Is Mathematics" by Courant and Robbins. It's a beautiful book, which is written in the 1950s and gives you a starts. In the, it doesn't assume background more than high school mathematics, but describes practically all mathematics at the cutting edge of research at the in the 1950s, and it is. A marvelously well-written book, which gives you an excellent idea of what mathematics is all about. So I would suggest that you also what modern, what uh, mathematical research is all about. So I would strongly suggest that you read that book. Uh, the first book, of course, can be bedside reading, but what is mathematics requires a little more effort. It uh, is pleasant reading, but nevertheless, you have to work on it. That's uh, what I wanted to say. One more thing. I will uh, pass on this uh, uh, my uh, PDF file of my lecture to the organizers of this uh, meeting, <laughs> uh, and uh, he can they can make it available to anyone who wants it. Okay. Sorry. Is that okay? Is, uh, I yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, There are some uh, typos, but you can easily make out. So I I won't correct them before sending it to you. Thank okay, you then. Sir. Okay, sir. No, sir. So shall I say go goodbye? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Goodbye then. Okay.